Well, good evening and welcome to Baldwin Wallace University and to the Center for Innovation and Growth. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for our second Economic Insights panel to discuss the global, European, U.S., as well as regional perspectives and outlook on the economy in 2014 and beyond. My name is Dale Kramer. I direct four of the MBA programs here at Baldwin Wallace. And the, between the business division at BW and the MBA Association, we are co-sponsoring uh, this event this evening. The MBA Association consists of existing MBA students at BW, as well as alumni uh, with their MBA degrees from Baldwin Wallace University. We're very fortunate to have, um, again, back tonight, all of our outstanding panelists from last year. Um, and I've got the pleasure to reintroduce them to, to you tonight. Michael Widekal, a 1994 graduate of Baldwin Wallace, is the Executive Director of International Strategic Analysis, a world leader in country intelligence, economic forecasting, and international <coughs> business advisory services. He has a leadership role in assessing international opportunities for organizations that are seeking to expand their activities in new markets. Furthermore, Mr. Widercall is an expert in the fields of international affairs, demographics, and market analysis. He's frequently a speaker at international conferences, having spoken at events in multiple countries around the world. Michael, welcome back. Dr. Kevin Jakes is the Boynton D. Merch Chair in Finance at Baldwin Wallace. Prior to joining BW in 2005, Dr. Jakes spent 14 years as an economist with the U.S. Treasury Department in Washington advising Treasury officials and members of the George W. Bush administration on U.S. financial and banking system. A nationally recognized expert on government policy and finance, Dr. Jakes has advised representatives of China, Japan, and the European Union on matters of international banking and U.S. regulatory policy. His economic and financial commentaries have received hundreds of media citations. Kevin, welcome. Tom Waltemeyer is the CEO of Team NEO, our region's private sector economic development hub. Team NEO facilitates our region's economic competitiveness strategy and markets the Northeast Ohio region globally. Tom joined Team NEO following a 31-year career with major Northeast Ohio corporations, including BF Goodrich, as well as the Gian Company and Poly One Corporations, where he served as CEO of both organizations. Tom serves on the Board of Trustees at Baldwin Wallace and also has served on the executive committees and boards of many Northeast Ohio organizations. Welcome, Tom. Harvey Hobson, the director of the International MBA program at BW, will moderate the Q&A session tonight. Harvey received his undergraduate degree from Baldwin Wallace and earned his law degree from Cleveland State University. He served for 26 years in the United States Marine Corps in various capacities, including prosecutor, chief defense counsel, head of the legal department of the Naval Academy, head of the research division with the Pentagon, and general court-martial circuit judge for the Western <laughs> Pacific region. Additionally, Harvey has taught executive seminars in 19 different countries in a program operated by the U.S. State Department. Welcome, Harvey. So Michael, and Kevin, and Tom will each speak for approximately 10 to 12 minutes each uh, regarding their topics. Michael will first address the global and European economic scenario, then Kevin will discuss U.S. economic perspectives, and Tom, the economic trends for Northeast Ohio. After these three short presentations, we'll open it up for approximately a 30-minute Q&A session, which will be moderated by Harvey Hobson. So with that, Michael, please kick off tonight's panel discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. Uh, last year we did this in a monsoon, so conditions are far more favorable today, and I can assure you Things are also a little more optimistic today. When we talked last year, and I've been doing these type of things for many years, the, the mood has been very pessimistic. We've had a, a lot of economic problems around the world, a lot of political problems around the world. Things are slowly starting to improve, and I think you're going to hear that from all three of the panel speakers uh, here today. We're certainly seeing, with our company, a lot of uh, confidence, particularly here from our North American clients at the moment, uh, looking at the global economy and saying there are more and more opportunities out there. Before I look forward, we're going to look back a little bit. Let's look back at 2013 and see exactly what happened and why we are where we are now. 
Uh, global economic growth declined for the third consecutive year last year. The global GDP growth rate is estimated to have been about 2.9 percent last year. That's not that, uh, not that good of a, a result when you consider before the crisis the global economy was growing about 5 percent. Uh, we do expect a pickup, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but nevertheless we've seen a downward trend in recent years, both in developed economies as well as in emerging markets. Uh, I won't talk too much about North America because Kevin will uh, focus on that, but clearly the, here in the United States things are looking up. Uh, Canada and Mexico didn't perform so well in 2013. The Canadian economy has been buffeted by a real estate downturn, and Mexico continues to disappoint. The economy has been growing by less than 2 percent. Uh, uh, per year uh, recently, which is a very uh, disappointing result for Mexico. Uh, if you remember last year, uh, I was asked the question, is the Eurozone crisis going to be over if we talk about Europe? I predicted in the first half of 2013 it would reach its nadir and start to slowly, things would start to slowly improve. That's kind of what's happening. Uh, certainly Europe is still in a crisis. Most of Southern Europe is still in a recession. Unemployment rates in Spain are at about 27 percent, the same in Greece. The overall unemployment rate in Europe is near, near to 12 percent, which is still dangerously high. So there's, Europe it, it has reached the bottom, but it's going to be a long slog uh, in, in terms of coming back. What about China, the second largest economy in the world? Uh, it grew by 7.7 percent last year. That's the same growth rate that it achieved in 2012. And the, the shift in China from an export-driven economy to a uh, domestic consumption driven economy is underway uh, full speed in China and this is a change that's going to have major implications for the global economy going forward. One of the big economic stories last year was in Japan where uh, Abenomics, uh, Abenomics uh, Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe's policy of weakening the yen to boost exports actually has brought uh, at least a temporary end to deflation in Japan and boosted exports rather dramatically there. Uh, this is uh, one of the bigger developments of the past year. China, if you remember, Japan has been suffering from deflation for almost two decades now, for more than two decades, uh, with very low growth rates. So this is something that uh, is, is, is bears watching for some of the other developed economies facing the same problems as Japan. And then finally, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail in a couple minutes, a lot of the world's leading emerging markets started to run into trouble in 2013. With quantitative easing uh, coming to an end here in the United States, investors have grown less confident in the economic outlooks for a number of major emerging markets. And this has led to sharp currency depreciations, which is leading to major inflationary pressures in countries like India, Argentina, Brazil, Turkey, and a host of others. So that's just a quick look back at 2013. That's why we, where we, we are where we are. So what's the outlook for 2014? We do predict the global economy to grow at a higher rate uh, than it did in 2013. This would be the first acceleration since 2010. It, global economic growth could reach around three, between 3.5 and 4 percent if everything goes right. Uh, not a bad result uh, by the recent history, uh, the standards of recent history, but nevertheless still well below the 5 percent GDP growth rates that were achieved before the crisis. The, the out, we're very optimistic about North America. Uh, again, I won't mention much about the United States, but we think Canada and Mexico have a, a, an improving outlook over the near term, boosted, of course, by rising demand here in the United States. What about Europe? I, I remember in the Q&A last year, we had a lot of questions about what's exactly going on in Europe. Well, our prediction in Europe is one for longer term stagnation. The recessions are coming to an end uh, in most of the economies. Well, perhaps not France, because France has been very late in, econ in implementing <laughs> economic reforms. So France may, in fact, be entering a second uh, recession in quick succession. Nevertheless, what we look at Europe is a, 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 a region that's going to experience a lot of stagnation. You're going to continue to have high unemployment for the foreseeable future. Domestic demand levels within Europe are going to be very low. That's going to force the region to depend more and more on exports. But of course, you have a pretty strong currency in the euro. So it's going to be very difficult to boost their export competitiveness when you have such a, a strong currency. And for some European economies, I talked about Japan, it took them two decades to pull out of uh, deflation. Some European economies are now facing the real prospect of deflation in their economies. And for those of you who know economics, you know just how difficult it is to, uh, to leave a deflationary cycle and what kind of impact that could have upon your economy. What about China? China, of course, is now the second largest economy in the world. We're predicting a slight slowdown in the coming years, down to around 7 to 7.5 percent GDP growth over the near term. Uh, again, this, can, this shift away from export-driven growth towards more domestic consumption-driven growth will continue. 
uh, providing many opportunities, of course, for U.S.-based exporters uh, down the road. This trend in emer other emerging markets towards lower investor confidence is continuing this year. We've seen it uh, already uh, in a number of countries. A number of the countries I mentioned earlier raised interest rates in recent days, desperately trying to attract more foreign investment to keep their currencies uh, at a respectable level and to keep inflationary pressures under control. And then finally, one thing to look at over the near term, particularly this year, are two major trade deals which are being negotiated at the moment. I mentioned them last year. There is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which includes the United States, uh, now Canada and Mexico, and a host of Asian and uh, Latin American countries lining the Pacific. It could include Japan as well in the near future. This would be one of the largest trade deals in the world. And if everything goes right, it could even be reached by the end of this year, though I would not bet on that. The other trade deal to watch is the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP. That is between the United States and the European Union. Uh, uh, it would be the largest trade deal in history if it were to work. Now, there is a lot of hesitation in Europe for this treaty, particularly in more protectionist countries such as France or Spain. But nevertheless, there is a major impetus, particularly in Germany, to have this, th this deal done. That also means it could be done within the next 12 to 18 months. I can't. Uh, talk about 2014 without mentioning a few political and economic risks which uh, face the, Europe, uh, the world economy this year. Uh, of course, the Middle East bears watching. What's happening right now in the Middle East is you've had an Arab Spring, which has turned into an Arab Winter. We have unrest uh, across the region. So far, this unrest has been largely confined to, a, to countries that do not have a major impact on the global economy. However, if this unrest were to spread to a major manufacturing company like Turkey, or even worse, if this unrest were to spread to a country like Saudi Arabia or perhaps even Kuwait, that would have a massive impact upon the global economy for it would send global oil prices soaring if we saw major unrest breaking out in Saudi Arabia, a weakening of the monarchy in that country, or, for, or perhaps a, a major uprising in Kuwait as we've seen a lot of political instability in that country. Uh, another thing that bears watching on the political side are these border disputes in Asia right now. I don't know if you've seen these on the news, but uh, China has become very aggressive in asserting its claims to certain disputed borders. Most importantly, its uh, claims to a small group of islands in the East China Sea, which are currently claimed and def controlled by Japan. It is very important for the world economy if the world's second and third largest uh, countries are disputing a, a, a group of islands in the, in the East China Sea, particularly if the third largest economy is backed by the world's largest economy. Uh, China also has border disputes with India and most of Southeast Asia. And with its growing assertiveness, with an increasing number of ships and planes flying along this border, sailing along this border, the potential for a clash at some point is growing rather high. And that would have a major impact on the global economy. A uh, couple other things to look at uh, from the United States standpoint. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier with, with some of my colleagues. There's a lack of trust in many countries now for US businesses in, the, uh, in lieu of the Snowden affair, where the, N the NSA spying scandal has now could be costing some US businesses uh, investment or, or, or contracts, particularly in the fields of defense or IT. That's something that bears watching. Uh, of course, uh, a couple other things to watch. Russia will be in focus this year as the Olympics are coming up there. There is a real threat of a terrorist attack against the Sochi Winter Olympics. And of course, the situation in neighboring Ukraine could draw in Russia. For if Russia loses Ukraine, if Ukraine ends up with a very pro-Western government, Russia's geopolitical position in Europe will be <coughs> devastated. And this is something that uh, President Putin may not stand for. A couple economic risks to look forward to in, or look forward to in 2014. Uh, I mentioned last year currency wars, uh, the, the drive to push global currencies downward. And we've seen Japan do it. And now we've seen a lot of emerging markets have their uh, currencies pushed downwards because of the lack of investor confidence. This could lead to an all-out currency war uh, throughout the world. Uh, and then again, emerging market unrest. We're seeing a lot of social unrest in a number of the world's largest uh, emerging markets at the moment. India, Turkey, for example, uh, are uh, Two, uh, Brazil with the World Cup coming up there and elections later this year is another market which could see major unrest inside, inside its borders. So what are we looking at over the longer term? We're looking at uh, a developed world where many of its leading economies are now facing, facing longer term stagnation, particularly Japan and much of Europe. 
does this mean the, year, the emerging markets can pick up the slack as they were expected to? Well, if you would have asked that question two or three years ago, the answer would have certainly been yes. But in, in the wake of what's happened over the past 12 months, there's far less certainty that the emerging markets will be able to pick up the slack for the slowing developed world. Uh, and the other thing, and I mentioned it last year, the key to, to economic growth will remain export competitiveness, the drive for export competitiveness. Are you competitive on cost? Are you competitive from a productivity standpoint? infrastructure, uh, political stability, all of these things will be the key drivers for uh, growth in the future. Which countries will win that race to export competitiveness? Well, we'll have to wait and see. So that, that's, all, that's all I'm going to say for now. Now, as I mentioned last year, this is the basis. There's a, there's a much larger presentation behind this, uh, uh, this little talk that I've given now. So if you'd like me to send you that uh, presentation, there's a sign-up form, I believe, which you can fill out. You'll, you can put your email on your email address on there. I'll be happy to send you the presentation. You can have all of the details behind what I talked about uh, just now. Okay, thank you, very, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. We're going to hold questions until all three um, speakers address the uh, group. And Dr. Kevin Jakes, if you could uh, give us the uh, national. Thank you, Harvey. Um, I was talking to my 10-year-old daughter. I was in her, her bedroom one afternoon not all that long ago, and I confessed to my daughter, I said, I'm having trouble figuring out how I'm going to make this presentation. And she said to me, how come? And I said, well, there's a lot of good news to tell. I said, but honey, I'm an economist, and I understand that economies don't go in this kind of simple linear path. Things are bad, they go to good, it's a straight line, and it's very clean and simple. And so when I uttered the phrase linear path, she kind of looked at me and said, Dad, I'm really more interested in talking about art projects or horses. And at which point in time, I said, OK, I've got to have a different approach to this. And, and I, I, I stopped and I thought, where's my discomfort coming from? And so I tended to refer to the night. She actually helped me think about this, if I can't explain it to a 10-year-old. Um, so I, I refer to it as guarded optimism. And let me explain why I have what I call guarded optimism. There's a lot of good news. Michael's absolutely right. There's been a lot of good news in recent years. Um, and 2013 is no, ex uh, no exception, and it is getting better. In the fourth quarter of 2013, the U.S. economy grew at a 4.1% growth rate. That is the fastest growth rate we've seen in the, since the end of the Great uh, Recession in June of 2009, and that is for the first time an above average growth rate. Uh, and it's those above average growth rates, which increase output, which generate jobs. So that's good news. Um, the unemployment rate, if you saw the most recent numbers, the unemployment rate in the United States fell to 6.7% last month. That's the lowest it has been in a long time. Uh, inflation remains a ch in check, uh, a 1.5% annualized rate. Um, if you're a homeowner, some good news. In 2013, according to the National Association of Realt Realtors, uh, home prices rose by 11.3 percent, and millions of homeowners who were underwater, had negative equity, if you will, now have, uh, now have positive equity in their home. Even those who bought homes at the, the worst of all possible times during the financial crisis, 2006, 2007, 2008, even some of those uh, home buyers are now approaching positive equity. The stock market last year rose 30%, so you're, you're feeling better. Your 401k is looking good. And I mentioned these last two, the home prices and stock market increase, because that has a huge impact on the wealth of consumers. If you're an average American, the vast majority of your wealth is in your home, number one, and number two, your 401k, your IRA, your retirement plan. So that has a huge impact on wealth, which in turn influences your consumption not rapidly, but it tends to influence your consumption. And consumption is the primary driver of the U.S. economy. It accounts for about 70% of, of economic growth. So as consumers go, so goes the economy. And then finally, I can't pass this one up, the political economic environment that we now see in Washington, D.C. actually got better during the year. We started out talking about sequestration, budget cuts, debt limits, and all that. And for the first time in a long time, we've actually seen some positive progress on the budget deficit as members, some selected members of Congress were able to, to work out a relatively smaller deal. So that's a very positive uh, event. Now, we're four and a half years after the Great Recession, 
the end of the Great Recession. And so there are a number of reasons why we can, in fact, be positive. Well, if that's all the case, then why do I address it as guarded optimism? Why was I so uncomfortable trying to explain this, even to a 10-year-old? So I think about it a couple ways. First of all, GDP growth of 4.1% is above the historical average. But even if we look at a number of different ways to measure income, and that is the primary driver of that always important consumption, uh, income in the United States has not returned, inflation adjusted income in the United States has not returned to the level it was prior to the Great Recession. The fact of the matter is income adjusted for inflation, median income adjusted for inflation in the United States is now low, is still lower than it was before we entered the Great Recession. Okay? Um, there is growth in income, that's the good news, but the income growth is occurring very, very slowly. Second, um, as you may have witnessed, uh, so far this month it has been, the stock market has been rather unkind to investors. We had a wonderful 30% return uh, on the market uh, last year, and so far this year, the market is down about four, uh, so far this year and this month, the market is down about 4%. Now, uh, in recent years, I developed a, uh, a quantitative model. I call it the CJMPC model. Uh, it is a... Clever. <laughs> Tom's laughing at my, name, my naming here. It is a Monte Carlo simulation model that has all these wonderful mathematical properties. Only, only model builders and finance people would, would be interested Your in. Your daughter didn't... No, she had nothing to do with naming it CJMPC. Okay. Tough crowd up here, folks. Um, but here's what the CJMPC model does. I use six, over 60 years worth of data on the stock market. And it replicates how financial markets behave. And with a push of a button, that model simulates how the market will behave on out in the future. It runs, t with a, one push of a button, it runs 2,000 simulations of how the market's going to behave in the future. So I, I pushed the button the other day. And I said, what does it tell me about 2011? And now what that model tells me is, despite the 4% decline that has already occurred in the stock market, there is a 29% chance that the stock market is going to end the year lower than it currently is. So about a 3 in 10 chance. You say, well, how about the other side? What's the likelihood that we end up with another one of those really good years in the stock market that makes me feel good about my 401k? And the model basically said, hey, guess what? That's about a 3% a, a chance or less, okay? So the likelihood. Now, on top of that, let me throw in the unemployment rate. As good as it looks for the unemployment rate to fall to 6.7%, the fact of the matter is most of that reduction in unemployment came about because of just people leaving the labor force, not the creation of jobs. In December 2013, the United States economy created a total of only 74,000 jobs. We are still, we are still about 1.2 million jobs in this economy short of where we were before we went into the Great Recession. At the rate we were creating jobs in 2013, it's still going to take about another six seven, possibly eight months for us to return to the employment levels that existed back before the Great Recession began. Now, if you take all those together, all right, you take the fact that incomes aren't increasing, you take the fact that the stock market is looking a little shaky right now, you take the fact that we aren't necessarily really doing a great job of generating jobs. And I didn't even talk about what people would call the real unemployment rate. And what do I mean there? Real unemployment would say, well, let's add in the discouraged workers. Let's add in individuals who have skills and are working part-time or who are underemployed. They'd love to have a full-time job. They can't find it. Or they'd love to fully utilize their skills. If you look at the labor market that way, the unemployment rate is closer to 13.2% by official estimates. If I put all that together, what that says to me is, while the economy is growing and grew nicely in the fourth quarter, consumption's a little bit tenuous. 
And we need, that, we need the consumption portion of our economy to grow if, in fact, the economy is going to continue to move forward, continue to generate jobs. And here's one thing I think that people sometimes miss. We understood this when I was at the Treasury Department. It's true in recessions. It's true when the economy is going well. The single most important of all economic variables is economic growth. Because economic growth creates jobs. Economic growth puts income in people's pockets. And economic growth helps reduce the budget deficit. For all the talk uh, either side of the aisle about what is or is not right about the budget deficit, the fact of the matter remains the single greatest thing we can do in this economy to solve the issues of the budget deficit is to have the economy grow. All right, Budget deals aside. So let's continue on. Why, again, that my guarded optimism? Let's look, at the, let's look at the business side of the equation. Also critical to economic growth is business spending, spending on plant and equipment and machinery. It increases our capacity, if you will. Um, business spending in 2003, currently, business spending on plant and equipment and machinery, capital expenditures, as a percentage of a firm's sales are at or near a 22-year low. And this is just perplexing to, this is perplexing to economists. I know this is the topic that's come up at the Federal Reserve. I know it's a topic that's been talked about at the Treasury Department. Why is it that in the process of trying to generate economic growth, businesses don't want to invest in plant, equipment, and machinery? Part of that, I believe, is a reflection of uncertainty. There have been some surveys done recently and uh, those surveys say that business leaders are particularly pessimistic about two things going forward, health care costs for employees, number one, and number two, uncertainty about government economic policy. And I just had a friend of mine who runs a small business stop over at the house not that long ago, and this is exactly what he wanted to talk about. Tell me what government economic policy is going to look like because he was scared for what it meant for his business. All right, and then finally, um, despite all the good news on the political economic front, there are in fact possible stresses in the political arena. In 2013, we had sequestration, we had budget deficits, and we had the budget ceiling, the debt ceiling. And Treasury will soon be again up against that debt ceiling and having to address those issues. And while the political climate in terms of getting deals done has improved in D.C., I will remind you that 2014 is a, mid, is a year of mid-year elections, midterm elections, all right? And in the D.C. world, when you're sitting there and you're at the Treasury Department or you're, or you're at the Federal Reserve or you're at some of these government agencies and you're trying to undertake economic policy, you are constantly aware of the fact that politics will come in. And in particular, politics comes in during midterm election years, of which this is one, and presidential election years. So the possibility of more political gridlock, that kind that we all got tired of seeing last year, even though it looks like it's going away, there's a very good chance we will see another round of that running through at least November, as Republicans and Democrats don't necessarily want to give each other much ground. Dr. Jacob, I'm going to have to intercede. And your... at that point, I am done. Thank you, Harvey. I timed myself out pretty well. Well, I want to intercede on behalf of your daughter's behalf. Uh, <laughs> I don't want you to exceed her attention span. Get to the horses here. We missed the horse part. Um, well, that, that'll come in the Q&A part, I, I think. Uh, Tom, would you like to address the sure. Northeast Ohio Ab and the region? Absolutely. Am I working here? All set. You are. Great. Well, thank you all for coming here uh, tonight and uh, braving, the, uh, braving the cold as well as uh, all the, the stories of the economy. Uh, I'd like to uh, share with you some perspectives on Northeast Ohio itself, so obviously a lot closer to home. And I'm going to be working off of a couple of <coughs> things that, are, that have been uh, handed out on your, on your chair. And there's... Um, two different ways of trying to look at the question of how Northeast Ohio is doing. Uh, one of these is a very much a bottoms-up look, and another one is a little more top-down using a lot of the indicators that, uh, that Michael and Kevin uh, often speak about. And the bottoms-up look is this uh, two-page uh, piece that says uh, major capital investments. Uh, totaling over $17 billion now over about a five-year period uh, as we've been tracking them. 
all of these, you know, this is real. Right? We're, we talk a lot about indicators, and I'm going to get to that, but this is real. These are cranes in the sky. These are people working at, uh, you know, building facilities. Uh, these are people installing facilities. These are people making a choice to make an investment to make things better. And we unfortunately don't have a lot of historical data to compare this period to, but as best, best as we can gather around Northeast Ohio, we have never seen a time where there has been this much real investment activity going on. And you can see by and large, this is private sector oriented or at least non-government. There's some things in here that are government related, but by and large, it's businesses or large nonprofits like hospitals uh, that, are, uh, that are doing this. This tells you a lot about the economy because this only happens if people believe uh, in the future and people see opportunity. You know, the picture on the very front is a picture of the uh, newly opened over the last year, uh, World Technology Center for Bridgestone, uh, Bridgestone Firestone uh, Tire Company. And even though they don't make, uh, Bridgestone doesn't make tires in Akron anymore, they chose Akron to rebuild a new technical center. That says something about the technology uh, that we have here and our ability to be world class. So that's the bottom up look. A little bit more of a top down look is this piece with the ship on the front. Uh, every quarter, uh, Team NEO publishes a quarterly economic review, and so this is our most recent report. We're going to have another one in about a month. Uh, and every quarter we, we do a feature of some particular uh, topic. So if you open it up one page, you see a little spread about exports. Uh, working off a, a study from the Brookings uh, Institute, uh, we use their data to do a reasonable estimate of export activity out of Northeast Ohio. Based on the industry mix we have here, uh, Brookings looked at how different, how well different industries are doing at exporting, and, and so we uh, took that back to what it probably means Northeast Ohio is doing. Uh, and it's a, it's a positive picture. Uh, our exports are estimated to be uh, much higher than they were uh, even 10 years ago, uh, and to have recovered from the recession uh, based on this kind of uh, analysis. Uh, if you open the uh, brochure all the way to the six charts that are there, uh, this is our standard dashboard uh, for looking at the uh, Northeast Ohio economy. Uh, and I'm going to skip over the first one here and, and finish actually talking about the number of people working. Uh, but you can see the unemployment rate. Uh, and, uh, well, just to make first comment, let me tell you what that first chart is so you can look at it. The first chart with all the bars is an estimate of, of the number of people working in Northeast Ohio. And it's organized by quarter, so you can see the year-over-year -year comparison uh, for the like quarter uh, the year before. And you can see that it's been gradually going upward but still running, if you look at the scale, about 100,000 jobs below where we were before the recession. If you then go down to the next panel, which is the unemployment rate, uh, and here we're looking at Northeast Ohio, Ohio, and the U.S. All three are running at around the same area, <coughs> around this 7% uh, or high 6 area. This is uh, um, quarterly data. The uh, and you can see we've come down. Now look where Northeast Ohio was before the recession. We were around six. So you can say, well, we're only one percentage point higher now than we were in unemployment coming into the recession. But I just told you that we may, there's a good estimate that we're down 100,000 jobs. Well, how can we be down 100,000 jobs and have our unemployment rate only one point higher? And that's because of people dropping out of the labor force. So the, uh, the real unemployment rate is higher than this uh, in Northeast Ohio and nationally, what a lot, of, a lot of us might call real. In fact, one of my questions I wrote down for my colleagues here is, if you're going to advise people what unemployment rate to actually watch, if you had to pick one, what would it be? 
And I would submit it isn't the one you always read, uh, but that's the one that's politically uh, popular uh, for people in office. But that's so we show the, the popular uh, unemployment rate, and that's what we're reporting here. But when you look at the fact that our jobs aren't up, but our unemployment rate is almost down to where it was, that tells you something else is going on in there, and it's the people dropping out of the labor force. The, uh, the chart below that, the bottom of that, uh, that panel, uh, takes the uh, uh, job count <coughs> numbers and divides it out by sector. So the one that goes up and down a lot, because this is not seasonally adjusted, is construction. So you can see, obviously, the seasonality there. We're, we're edging our way back uh, in the construction industry. The, by far and away, the biggest economic sector is what we've called services here. It's probably 65, 70% of the total, maybe even more than 70%. Uh, and that's just about back to 1.0. So just about back in terms of number of jobs uh, compared to before the recession. Manufacturing had been recovering, it's kind of plateaued. Still down uh, more than 10% in terms of jobs than before the recession. Over on the other side, up at the top, we've got a, a Moody's Analytics estimate of GRP, a gross regional product in Northeast Ohio. You see it continuing to eke its way upward. Uh, if the, uh, uh, the forecasts are right and we get a couple percent, we'll actually be back to the top. Or equally, we could be reaching our highest ever GRP uh, this coming year. Next uh, panel talks about office vacancies. And the final one that we could talk more about maybe in the Q&A is what's going on in the shale gas uh, drilling activity, uh, permitting and drilling, because it's really starting uh, to take off. Let me go back just to the job, uh, the job count number. These are the ones that probably is the most interesting to everybody. How many people are actually working? How many of you have seen a series of like every month drumbeat in the Plain Dealer that the Cleveland metropolitan area uh, has lost jobs compared to a year ago and they report that month after month after month and uh, anybody seen those, seen those reports? A few people? All right. Well, work we've been doing with Cleveland State and with the Cleveland Fed looking back at the numbers is finding that is completely wrong. And it's not the uh, plain dealer's fault. The fact is those are based on initial estimates uh, of a not very large sample size, so there's a lot of error in it. That's sort of like that linear progression. Who, progression, who's he, what's it, that uh, Kevin was talking about. <laughs> so sample error in surveys on jobs is very serious. And they do these surveys, they announce the number, and about a year later they go back and revise the number. And the revisions over the last 18 months have been significant, and they've all been positive. And so instead of the fact that you've been reading every month that the Cleveland MSA jobs have been lower than a year ago, they in fact have been higher than a year ago, every single time that that's been reported. Now, we're still in the process of going back and looking at our own numbers, because we've been using those, those numbers. Our numbers are regional. Uh, actually four or five MSAs compared to just Cleveland. Uh, but it is, and some of that, so the effect is washed out a little bit. Uh, but I do believe that the actual job numbers are better than in, than are in this report. But the main thing is, you walk out of here with one simple thing. It is not the case, based on the best available numbers, it is not the case that the Cleveland metropolitan area has been steadily falling behind in jobs compared to a year ago. In fact, we've been having modest increases. And the difference in this game between a loss and a gain is infinite. Because uh, it means people are actually working <coughs> rather than people not. So that's the one thing I would take away from, for, the, uh, for the regional economy. And it's uh, great to be here with you all. And jump into Q&A, are we? Thanks. Um, I'd like to give you, ladies and gentlemen, as much time as possible to ask questions. Um, we have about 15 or so minutes to get through this. Um, I would ask that, Is it that hard for, for, for those of you that desire to get the um, presentation from Michael, um, there is a sign up sheet <coughs> we could begin to circulate that now and if you would provide your name and your email address, Michael will send you um, his presentation which is more in depth than what he has given here 
and please try and write legibly so he doesn't have to decipher ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, Michael made the mistake earlier this evening of telling me he was going to New York and asking what for, and he said one of his clients is the NBA. And so playoffs are coming. I want to pull him aside and talk about some inside information he's going to get from him. There. So. Okay, let's, um, let's take the first question. Let's take the uh, first question, please. Yes. Um, this is for Tom Waltemar. Hi, Tom. How are you? Very good. Thanks um, for coming. My pleasure. Um, so, I'm acutely aware that the plain dealer reports the job losses. Do they also report the revisions in the statistics? No. New. <laughs> Thank you. It's kind of old, and yeah, it's not news at the time. No? And, um, uh, yeah, and and, fe and the federal federal government doesn't um, promote them either, so they probably didn't even know they're going on. So I'm actually much more critical of the federal data that's going out than I am at the plane dealer. They're just trying to do their best with the releases they get and try to report them, and the data that's coming out, in our opinion, is really misleading. Professor Dudovich, then we'll come back. This question is to piggyback off of your last comment. I wondered if you could tell us if there's any particular sectors or job areas that are growing that we can target as an academic institution to try to feed those job opportunities that you're seeing in the data? That is a, that's a very good question. The, the, um, and I'm trying to think of sources I can even point you to. We have a number of them on our website. Uh, so look up teamneo.org and it'll take you to the Cleveland Plus uh, business website and a variety of our economic reports are in there. Uh, certainly, when you look at occupations, uh, the uh, uh, biomedical area, you know, the healthcare sector is continuing generally to add. You know, there's cost pressures out there, so it may not be growing as fast. Um, we're continuing to see uh, management, technical job, professional and technical um, areas continue to grow. Um, we know that uh, our region is generally short on engineers of many kinds. Um, and, you know, those would be a, a sampling of them. But we could talk further. be happy to help with that. Yes, please. I'm sorry, I can't call your name. I'm at that point. In this I'm Rick Nash. Okay, well, Rick, I, I'm at that point where I have more history than promise, and I can't read your name. No. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, Michael, Mike, I have two questions. One is, I think they're related. Uh, you referred to stagnation in both Europe and Japan. Does the population slash immigration policies of these countries play a significant role? Is it correctable? <laughs> Well, so yes, a, a huge role because in both in both Europe, most of Europe, and certainly in Japan, we're seeing working age and purchasing age populations fall dramatically. <coughs> Japan experienced its largest ever annual population decline last year, so it play it plays a huge role. It's driving down <coughs> domestic demand. That's helping to fuel deflationary pressures. We're seeing the same in southern Europe, particularly countries like Spain, Italy. Uh, Portugal have dramatically low birth rates. Germany as well. Germany is an economy which has performed relatively well of late, but it's entirely down to exports. Its domestic market is shrinking. They just had a, uh, they did their first census since before the wall fell because there was a lot of uh, opposition to doing a census. And they, real, they found out the population was 1.7 million s smaller than what they had thought it was. So uh, it was just a tremendous, it's just a sign of exactly how poor the demographic situation is in those countries. Is it reversible? Yes, through immigration of highly skilled workers and high income uh, consumers, but that's not very desirable. In these, it's particularly in countries that are ethnically based. Japan is a pretty homogeneous country, same for many uh, uh, European countries. So immigration is a very touchy subject in those countries. The, but the next question I think is sort of related, but uh, I read where Africa is starting to show, obviously, a very low pace, some pretty substantial growth, but they have a lot of population. Okay. Well, Afri Sub-Saharan Africa is forecast to grow faster than any other region in the world over the next five years. We're looking at 
uh, growth of, of, of above 6%. And in those countries where either you have vast mineral resources or some degree of political stability, you're seeing very healthy rates of economic growth. And what's positive about the recent growth is we're starting to see infrastructure development. Previous growth uh, was really based simply on extraction industries with little done to improve the competitiveness of sub-Saharan African economies. But we're seeing now an investment in education. We're seeing major investments in infrastructure. And that boosts the prospects for longer term growth. So it's all a question of stability. There's too many countries where there's internal conflict, where investors are just afraid to go into. But if the, those countries that can achieve a, a prolonged period of stability, the economic outlook is very positive. Thank you. No problem. Yes, the gentleman here. Hi, um, Chris Angler. Uh, you talked about uh, GDP for the next year growing at, I think, 4.5%. And I was just wondering, when you talk about the guarded optimism in the U.S. and um, the slow growth in the emerging markets, where that growth is going to come from, and maybe it's to Africa, um, but what countries, I guess, okay. are focus on. And, well, and just a second part, um, is like the 3.5, 4.5, is that going to become the new norm to expect? Okay, good question. Well, I don't, I don't believe the 5% GDP growth rate that was achieved before the crisis is going to be re achieved over a prolonged period anytime soon. Uh, we're seeing much more uh, tempered investment in emerging markets and, of course, stagnation in many key developed uh, economies. The growth is going to come from a couple of places. Uh, if you look at the developed world, it's going to come from what we call the new world economies, the United States, Canada, Australia, economies with growing populations, which goes back to what we talked about with stagnation, economies with room to grow, both geographically in terms of resources. It's also going to continue to come from an economy like China. China is now the second largest economy in the world, and we're still looking at growth rates in excess of 7% over the near term. And as we go longer, we're still looking at growth rates in excess of 6%. So that's going to be a key driver of growth. And other emerging markets, emerging markets that have large internal markets, such as Indonesia or the Philippines or Vietnam, they have uh, the potential to grow at about 6 <coughs> to 7% in the coming years. That's going to be the primary driver of growth. That'll help to offset the stagnation in the other developed world economies over the near term. No problem. Other questions? One and then two. Hi, Jeff Stevenson. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, it's been very informative. But I have uh, two questions uh, for Michael and Kevin. Two things happened this week that were pretty interesting. The first was uh, Turkey drastically increased their interest rate at Central Bank. Um, the second was the Fed announced that they're going to be tapering another $10 billion. So it looks like it's pretty safe to say, in, in t unless things change, that they will taper $10 million each month, $10 billion each month. So my questions are, do you see this as a common theme with the countries in uh, this predicament in emerging markets? And second of all, it's hard to predict what Janet Gamble is going to do because we have no track record. But do you see this, if emerging markets get into turmoil as we unwind the QE, do you think that could change Fed policy? Why don't you take Turkey first? Sure. Well, mine, certainly, yeah. Mine's easier to go second. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. This is, this is going to continue. Yeah, in, in, we've already seen South Africa and India, as well as Turkey, raise interest rates just in recent days. These are all countries, emerging markets with large current account deficits, which require large amounts of investment to fund their economic growth. With, the US, with a lot of that uh, easy money coming from the U.S. and that being reduced now, yes, that's going to be a trend. We're seeing... Uh, this lack of an, uh, investor confidence drive uh, currencies downward. This is fueling inflationary pressures. You're going to continue to see interest rate hikes in a number of these emerging markets going forward. So I don't foresee any change with that trend over the near term. Um, and the second, part of, the second part of the question, for those of you unfamiliar, uh, the Federal Reserve has for years undertaken a policy called quantitative easing, whereby they go into mortgage markets, longer term government security markets, and they're buying up bonds, and they were buying up to the tune of about $85 billion a month. Um, and now what has begun to happen is the Federal Reserve has, in effect, taken its foot off of the accelerator. Um, and now we run the risk of some of our markets, our, our stock market's a little volatile. Our, there's questions about what the emerging markets are going to look like going forward, and the question is, is the Fed going to continue to take its foot off the accelerator at the tune of about $10 billion, uh, a month? 
And I think the answer is absolutely they're going to continue to do exactly what they have been doing. Uh, chairman Bernanke has effectively uh, served his last meeting as chairman of the Fed. The new chairman is Janet Yellen. And I think it's critically important. I was just talking to Politico, or I interview, had an interview with Politico earlier today on this topic. I think it's absolutely critical that the new Fed chairman comes from within the Fed system. And I think what you're going to see is a continued $10 billion off in a very systematic, very orderly fashion, unless the, the policymakers at the Federal Reserve truly believe we're going to see another recession. And I don't see that happening. I don't think they see that happening. And here's why. Financial markets last May became a little skittish, okay, a little more than a little skittish, and you would know that, Jeff. Uh, when the Federal Reserve said, we're going to start to take money, we're going to, it's called tapering. We're not going to buy as many bonds. They were talking about it in theory, and the markets got skittish. So now they've actually begun to do it, and the markets have responded fairly well. But here's the reason why they won't change the policy. You're going to see about $10 billion come off each and every month. If they now suddenly start to change their policy, uh-oh, financial markets are skittish, so we better take our, we better not, we push the accelerator hard, push it softer. The answer is financial markets will respond by saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't understand what the Federal Reserve is doing anymore. And now what you've done is you've introduced more uncertainty into financial markets caused by the fact that they can't figure out what the Federal Reserve policy is. The Federal Reserve is purposely trying to get out of the market in a very predictable, well-communicated fashion to exit QE3, as it's called. Um, and I think there is a recognition, I know there's a recognition on the part of some economists that interest rate policy in recent years hasn't worked as well as otherwise had been anticipated. So there's a very good reason to get out of QE, and the Federal Reserve simply wants to do it in a very predictable fashion. To not be predictable, to put your foot on the accelerator, off the accelerator, push hard, push soft, that's going to just confuse financial markets, and, and no matter what you do in that case, now the markets won't be able to figure things out, and they will run from risk. They'll run away from the stock market. Okay, Max, and then we'll come down to you. Hi, hi Max. Uh, I have a question for Michael. Uh, what do you think about the situation in Ukraine and what that will mean for Europe in the future? Ah, good question. Uh, well, in Ukraine, if, if, if you've been following the news, you see that there's a, a major political standoff between the part of Ukraine which would like to be oriented with Europe and the West and the part of Ukraine which would like to be oriented, oriented with Russia. Uh, this standoff has reached a critical point where the government has two alternatives. It's either going to launch a massive crackdown on the protesters or it's going to give in to their demands. Uh, I don't believe there'll be a massive crackdown, but there are a couple of factors which, which warrant watching. One, the president uh, of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, is basically, he knows as long as he keeps his job, he stays out of prison. And as soon as he loses a job and he stays in the country, he's in prison. <laughs> So he has that incentive to, st to do all he can to stay in power. And he's backed by some very rich uh, Ukrainian oligarchs based in the eastern part of the country. The other factor, and perhaps the, more, the geopolitically more interesting one, is what will Russia do? Uh, for, for Russia, Ukraine is its key to Russia's geopolitical position in Europe. If it loses Ukraine, and if this standoff results in a very pro-Western government taking full control in Ukraine, it'll be a major geopolitical blow for a president of Russia who's been riding high recently after his success in Syria, his uh, ability to bring the, he has the Winter Olympics coming forward. Uh, he, he's managed to keep the political opposition down. So this is a major test for the Russian president as well. How will he react and how will Europe react if there is a crackdown or Russian intervention in the conflict in Ukraine. So it's, it's something that bears watching. It's taking place as we speak. And in the next few days, I think we're going to have a better idea of what our answer will be. Richard. Yeah, I'm Richard Burns. And the question's from Michael. And this is uh, the drawing your experience from Europe uh, in comparison to a trend that's been going on here in the States and more specifically in the state of Ohio, which has been a leader at the forefront of supporting entrepreneurial programs, um, investing and putting in place uh, uh, organizations that help develop and support that. 
And Northeast Ohio is a leader in that area, specifically, you know, Third Frontier, Team Neo, Jumpstart, Bio, Enterprise, et cetera. Um, it's been a very strong push in Northeast Ohio. It's helping to create new jobs, uh, new opportunities, new businesses. Do you see anything like that in uh, Europe? Uh, and maybe the more advanced economies, or just a comparison? There's certainly a major difference in, in, in <coughs> the way that type of business is done in the United States and in most of Europe, particularly on the continent. Uh, in continental Europe, entrepreneurship is, is, is something that's rather rare. Uh, you don't have much support from the government. In fact, it takes a long time to get your business started. I'm in a, in a country which is relatively liberal when it comes to entrepreneurial uh, uh, activities, Luxembourg. Uh, and it still took me three months to have my company going from being registered to actually being launched. Uh, there was even a delay of two weeks because the official printer was broken for one of the papers that needed to be uh, completed for my, uh, that's, that's not a joke, that happened to the entire country, there were no businesses for, registered for two weeks. Uh, it's worse in other countries. The big problem is in Europe, if you fail, you're done, you're done. There is no second chance, whereas in the United States, it's often a badge of honor if you failed six or seven times, try again. If you fail one time in France or in Germany, it's very, very difficult. Another uh, major difference, we talked about this earlier, was is, is if you're a small business and you want to hire someone in Europe, well, you have to pay them decently. You have to pay a lot of tax, a lot of social security, and good luck if they're no good trying to get rid of them because you'll pay them again for a couple of years. So there's very uh, little incentive uh, to hire people for small businesses. And, and the most telling statistic, I, I mentioned this at our table at the dinner earlier, it, of the world's 1,000 largest companies, uh, 26 have been created in the state of California in the last 35 years, 26. You know how many have been created in the entire continent, sec, region of continental Europe? One. That tells you all you need to know about uh, entrepreneurship in Europe right now. And for an economy that's facing long-term stagnation, which is facing uh, declining domestic markets, they need entrepreneurship. And some places are starting to realize that. You see in the UK, for example, a lot of regions have become very aggressive at promoting exports and attracting foreign investment. Luxembourg itself, where I am, has become more aggressive. But the vast majority of regions and cities uh, in Europe have, have done nothing compared to what Tom's done with Team Neo or other groups like that. Uh, the, the support from the public sector is, is or from, the, from, from, from public organizations or private-based uh, organizations is far less than it is here. And I have personal experience with that. But. I would just add to that that the, um, and thanks for the, thanks for the recognition, but we actually don't, Team Neo itself doesn't actually work on entrepreneurship. We have a lot of partner organizations that do. Richard mentioned them and Jumpstart and BioEnterprise and so forth. But it is, uh, without question, in my opinion, uh, the single most important economic development uh, over the last 10 years in Northeast Ohio is that it has gone from being sort of like Europe when it came to uh, entrepreneurship to now a, a significant part of our economic development agenda in the region. And we are attracting as much venture capital into this area uh, as uh, anybody in the center of the United States. As much as Research Triangle, we're in the same territory as Minneapolis, which is known very much as an entrepreneurial area. And by a number of me measures, more than Chicago, which is an economy probably four or five times our size. That, for the long term, will be a gigantic benefit for this region. And the fact that we're having this meeting inside the, uh, the Center for Innovation and Growth uh, is uh, quite apropos, because this is where it all begins. Yes. Uh, yes, we've lost millions of jobs since we signed in the trade agreement. Can you give us any objections to the global economy and you see these jobs coming back? I don't know that I, I'll leave you the manufacturing. I don't know that I see the manufacturing coming back. What I would note is there is a tendency, there is a tendency to attribute uh, job loss due to things like NAFTA or wage differentials, there's a tendency for people to look at it and say it is driven by wage differentials. And wage differentials clearly are a player here. But there are also, and what is so often not recognized is there are, it's not just wage differentials, it's also productivity differentials. I teach a, a, an MBA class here 
And at some semesters, I pull out a, an example of a company I know, uh, uh, have knowledge of in particular, and this particular company, it produces its product in uh, East Asia, and it produces its product here in the United States. And the product is produced in East Asia on the, in terms of wages at about an eighth of what it costs in the United States, yet the U.S. facility is far more profitable for the company. How come? Because it's not just the wage differential, it's the productivity differential. So when I was talking earlier about capital expenditures, I don't know that product, I don't know that manufacturing will come back, but one of the things I do know is that if you want to sit there and you want to have productive firms in the United States, and you want to be able to compete in a world where our workers cost more, Productivity is the key, and where's productivity going to come from? It's going to come from highly trained, skilled labor. Um, it's going to come from investment by businesses in new plant, new equipment, new machinery, state of the art. It's going to come from technology. And so it's a, it, it's a more complex equation. But what I would look for is I would look for those firms who can offset that wage differential by investing in workers, investing in plant, in equipment, in machinery, and with the ultimate output being they are in, those firms are incredibly productive, far more than their foreign counterparts. But would it make sense to be at a level of senior level? No, yeah, here's the, here's the, you know, here's the diff, here's the, where the difficulty comes in, because there's a, there was a side of treasury that deals with the international, and, you know, we would have the discussions about this, and the, I, it, it sounds great in theory. Hey, let's level the playing field. We'll keep it simple. Canada, United States, Mexico, let's level the playing field. The problem is the level playing field is a really, it's so intuitively appealing, and it is such a complex concept. It's, it's to implement. To implement, yes, absolutely. It is a really complex, because countries have particular uh, we used to enter trade negotiations with some Latin American countries, and, and there are all kinds of little nuances. So when you sit down and you have these trade negotiations with other countries, I simply did research on the, for the Treasury Department on the issue. I never did any negotiating on it. You end up talking and negotiating about some of the most minute little details in a world where what you're really trying to do is level the playing field. And that makes it much harder than it appear than it would otherwise appear. Yeah, just to be controversial, I'll argue with your premise. So I don't remember. Oh, I thought you were going to argue with me. No, I'm going to argue with you. Okay. So I don't remember exactly what year the NAFTA went into went into place, but I don't know what 20 years ago or something in that territory. Yeah. So what's been the flow of people during that period of time? If the jobs have been lost to another country. Have we had people tending to move to where those are? Or have they been moving the other way, where supposedly the jobs have been lost? So where's the opportunity? Here or in Mexico? Why do we have 11 million people here, mainly Mexicans, if there's more opportunity, if we've lost all this opportunity in Mexico? So I think I'd argue with your premise in the first place was another reason why trying to have a level playing playing field in some definition is impossible because nobody can measure the playing field. Mm -hmm. So people are still trying to get here and the only reason the immigration has slowed down is because our economy has slowed down. There's been less jobs here because our economy has been with a wet blanket on top of it. So different point of view. Okay, we have time for one more question, and we'll take that here. Then I'm going to ask Jeff Jackson if he could come down front, please. Next question is for Tom. Yeah, Tom, um, Team Neal, um, I'm looking at the uh, source sheet here, and uh, I'm going to go with Precious because I'm from Lorraine County. Nice. And from Lorraine County, I see about maybe only three or four companies that have shown capital improvements. How do we change that? It seems like everything's concentrated here in Cuyahoga or Summit or whatever. So how do we change that so that we are appealing to even foreign investors to bring in more jobs to Lorraine County? <coughs> and if there's one in the Sandusky, uh, Erie County, that's how it hard. So, yeah. yeah, I think probably the biggest on there probably is the uh, U.S. Steel uh, expansion and the Republic, Republic Steel uh, expansion. 
Look, the, uh, uh, I think Lorain County, in many respects, has been doing a good job of kind of rebuilding itself up from sort of its industrial uh, base. Uh, or, uh, Lorain County Community College is a tremendous asset. Uh, can the, the number one driver of economic growth is skilled people. So keep getting more of your kids actually graduating from, uh, you know, from the good high schools in Lorain County and get them at least into Lorain County Community College and you will be attracting investment. It's the number one thing you want to do. Okay. Tom, I know Team Neo is our regional advocate for attracting business here. Right. As a practical matter, how competitive are we really as a region? We can compete very well for almost anything. You know, we're not the best in everything, but we're very competitive in a lot. Uh, over the last, this past year, uh, we closed uh, 16 new business attractions, the most we've ever done, uh, about 1,400 jobs. Uh, and this is competing with, you know, all over the United States where people had a choice. Uh, since we've been doing this work, we're now, I don't know, around 85 companies uh, over that period of time. And this isn't people picking up and moving. This is, those, uh, there's maybe 5% of them that. Most of the cases, it's growing companies who have a choice about where they do their next growth, and we're convincing them that they ought to do it here. Uh, and we have a great, uh, you know, the formula is great location, which we all, we all know, in the middle of the, you know, heartland of the economy. Uh, a relatively low cost of living, which means low cost of doing business. And a reasonably skilled workforce. To this point I just answered, we need to keep bumping that up because that is the engine uh, for future growth uh, and, and attracting uh, businesses. And uh, we have those in reasonably good uh, abundance, great logistics. We've got a you know, great base of existing businesses in higher education. So we have that formula uh, that we can compete with just about anywhere. Uh, as location, access to customers at a low cost is a very nice formula. Okay. As I get Jeff to come down front, I'm going to ask Kevin to put his Karnak the Great hat on. Um, and in your opinion, Kevin, what's the likelihood we'll see a financial crisis in 2014? So he saves the best for last, right? The, the best question, yeah. Okay, I'm polishing up my crystal. Now, realistically, folks, I don't, um, as, Har as Harvey knows, and, and some of you know, I have stated on national public radio, I've stated on television, I've stated on the Cleveland Plain Dealer editorial page that we will see another financial crisis. It is inevitable. Uh, I don't believe we will see it in 2014. We have an economy which is in better shape than it has been in years. Um, indicators of financial stress are still at very low levels. Our banks uh, are well capitalized. To me, I think the critical variable going forward, if we're going to see another crisis, and here's the one that worries me, is inflation. If we have, if, and I say that for the following reason, there's an expectation out there in financial markets that inflation is going to continue to be low, and that allows financial institutions and investors to take risks they otherwise would not. If inflation were to be un high and unexpected, then that could be disruptive to financial markets. There's nothing to indicate that that is the case, but that could disrupt financial markets. That could disrupt financial institutions. That could disrupt our stock market. Our bond market in particular, and those who invest in bonds, uh, would be particularly vulnerable. I would also mention to you the following. Um, banks are in a stronger position than they have been in years. They have raised capital on the order of two to three hundred billion dollars since the financial crisis. So bank, our, our financial institutions are stronger than they have been in a long, long time. Um, government regulators, I can guarantee you, are taking steps to try to assess systemic risk in financial crises. They're more proactive in looking for those problems than ever before. Uh, I was just at the Treasury Department back in the spring, um, and they're, doing, they're actively working, as are some of our Federal Reserve Banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland is doing a lot of work in this area. And then finally, um, I would simply say government regulators 
are infinitely further ahead in terms of if there were to be another crisis, how would we handle that? In 2005, I was Treasury's representative to a, to a, uh, a group asking the question of if a major bank in the United States were to fail, how would we handle it? A little light you know, activity for us to do. We never, I can guarantee you folks, we, we, two things. We never, absolutely never envisioned the financial crisis that we saw, okay? We didn't envision anything like that coming. And two, we didn't have a playbook. We didn't have a playbook. So in the event of a major financial crisis like the Great Depression, here's what you do. The government has a play, 10 years later, warp ahead, the government now has a playbook. The government has experience in a whole wide variety of programs to cut financial crises off before they occur, and if they occur to mitigate their effects, much, it's infinitely better than it was when I served on some of those committees 10 years ago. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs>